the reason a leader wears the muddy boots is because they had merged out of the work and they were already wearing those boots and they were already muddy anyway. And people began to recognize through their labor, through their effort, through their responsibility, through their taking of consequences, through their humility, that other people start to go, hey, how can I help you? Or they start to ask, what can I do to, to do what you're doing? Right. And they emerge out of the work. All right, Dave. So we're going to jump into a, a topic that I think will be relevant to uh, a lot of people listening to our podcast and relevant to us as we're, as we're digging into this work. Um, we were talking offline before we hit record. I, hopefully this will all come together into some thoughts for you guys. But um, I was telling Dave, I've, I've been processing through this phrase of what does it mean to be a muddy boots leader or uh, yeah, muddy boots leader of, of the work. And um reading through acts again. And I know Dave, you were reading through acts again recently as well. But, um, as I did that, um, this piece of the work in, uh, Paul's development as a leader and his investment in the work in Corinth really jumped out at me. And you see there, Paul, um, apparently was afraid and God spoke to him, um, and said, basically don't be afraid because, um, I have many in the city. And then he stays there for another year and a half. And, um, out of that comes a couple of leaders, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, and then they are, they're developing Apollos out of that. Um, and so as you pointed out, Dave, that that's not the first time that, that Paul did that, but that's just been jumping out to me that there's this dynamic with Paul where he slows down and he's, he's really helping others, um, to get some traction in the work there and raising them up as a leader alongside he's modeling to them. He's assisting them. Um, and then they turn around and do the same thing with Apollos um, and helping him to get some things corrected up uh, before he's launched out to do the to do the work. And so um, out of that, this phrase for me, and I know there's maybe other people who have used it in different ways, but this idea of the muddy boots leader um, has been emerging. And so um, I think you and I have just been talking about how important that conversation is to missions and to especially um I mean, just to be quite frank, to be honest, the, the, the generational gap and what does that look like as we're trying to raise up um, Gen Z and um, and older, but especially Gen Z to understand what does this look like to have muddy boots in being a leader? Uh, people don't care about your opinion until you've actually got some mud on your boots and you're actually getting in the work and doing the work um, so that you kind of understand what you're even talking about. So let's dive into this topic, Dave, where do you want to take us from there? Well, I, I would just start off with saying, like, what what are the ways that we're talking about apostolic leadership being defined from that story and what you're pulling out of the Muddy Boots illustration from Paul and Corinth? Um, in other words, what is the role of the leader? Is the role of the leader to be somebody who um, is up front telling everybody what to do? Is the role of the leader someone who's supposed to be behind everybody picking up their trash? Or is the role of the leader somebody that's in the middle um, doing the work with everybody, like what does that look like for you, and how do we, how do we begin to define what this type of leadership, muddy boots leadership, really looks like? Where are they? What are they doing? What does life look like for them? What do you think? Yeah, I think why I like this snapshot of muddy boots for Paul is we see him tent making, and uh, now why that was was that out of necessity because the money hadn't hadn't come down from. Uh, from Silas and Timothy, um, and probably there's a lot to that. But uh, but for whatever reason, he's he's um, shoulder to shoulder with this couple that uh, this Jewish couple, Priscilla and Aquila, um, and as they're working alongside of each other, Paul is apparently having a lot of conversations about the work, and um, and then this couple rises up through that process of becoming they become leaders, and so. We don't have a lot of detail about how that worked. How did he develop them as leaders? But it definitely was a shoulder to shoulder uh, piece. It wasn't just him throwing some books at them for them to read um, and him just standing up front and saying, hey, guys, here's what we need to do and just talking a lot. And then they suddenly picked up those ideas and then they figured it out. A, a lot of that 
apparently happened shoulder to shoulder as he was making tents with them, as he was in the synagogue with them, as he was in the marketplace, house to house. Uh, that was, it was a, a, a day, a daily life, um, yoking together that that happened. And, um, and to your question, it seems like Paul was doing his role was servant leader, that he was coming alongside of these guys and serving them, uh, to help them grow into, into their leadership role. You know, it also makes me kind of jump back in terms of calling the, the why question, like, why is Paul doing this to begin with? Um, and I think oftentimes when we're talking about like, well, we talk uh, the multiplying church and our leaders here, right? H3X. And so a lot of what we're focusing on is apostolic leadership and apostolic leadership or church planting or going into the harvest and putting the gospel where it hasn't been before. It has a nice ring to it. Like it sounds pretty, uh, sorry for the vernacular, but it sounds pretty sexy whenever you hear about it. Right. So everybody's yeah. like, that's what my kids say now. Uh, if I get in trouble for that, I'm sorry to any listeners who are offended by that. Um, <laughs> it's in vogue. There's the 1990s version. Um, but it, it's, it's a cool concept, right? Where you're like, oh, yeah, there's, there's this guy and they do these things and people right. look up to them. And so you get this rosy picture of what it is. But I think the calling of Paul, um, what really strikes me about Paul is, is that the why behind what he did was, yes, he was called in Acts 9, right? Whenever yes. the Lord Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? You're going to be my voice to the Gentiles, and I'm going to put you in front of kings, right, and uh, leaders, and you're going to speak the gospel to them. And this is going to, and, and, and Jesus literally says to him, you will suffer much for my name. Right. I think the idea behind all of this, especially the calling, seems a lot of fun until that suffering piece comes in. And when that suffering piece comes in, there's consequences to the call. There's consequences to the identity, to the actions of apostolic, right? That's whenever we're really going to step back and ask, why am I doing this? And we just see that Paul, no matter what, I mean, stoned to death, left for dead, right? Yes. Lashes, go through Philippians and read all of the things, shipwrecked three times, all the things that happened to him. Right. And yet he still keeps going. When you're reading through, thinking through um, Corinth, and even you made mention whether or not Paul was having to tent make because the money hadn't made it there yet or not, or it was an intentional decision, it doesn't change the fact that Paul was doing whatever it took to accomplish what God had sent him there to do. Right. And if that meant in that season he had to make tents in order to feed himself because the provisions weren't there, then that's the way that God provided. He was going to do that. My question yeah. is this. What do you think made Paul continue to say yes and be responsible for the Gentile calling, even whenever it required the things that it required of him? What is it that drove him? Why do you think he kept doing it? Didn't quit. Didn't just walk away when it got really hard. Um. So why didn't he quit? I mean, I think he he felt clarity that this is what God had called him to do. And this is what God was doing from all the way back to that calling. Um, and that, um, and that he needed to move the ball forward in whatever way it was needed for that moment. What do you think drives people to make that decision in life? Cause I think for me, one of the biggest hindrances I see in terms of leadership development, and you mentioned Gen Z, um, as we got these 20 somethings and below that are rising up into leadership, they're going to have to take the mantle of responsibility. Right. And I think one of the biggest jumps that has to happen is for someone to move from that adolescent teenage way of thinking that right. I just kind of get all the fun without the responsibility. I use the illustration uh, of our family, right? we got dishes on the table and I look at one of my kids and go, Hey, help me pick up the dishes. And then they get just their dishes. And I say, Hey, grab the rest of them. And they say, well, those aren't mine. And I, my response to them is always, well, they're not mine either, but yeah, here I am picking them up. And part of right. that is because I know that as a role as a father and my wife as a mother taking care of our home, somebody's got to do it. And if it's not gotten, if it hasn't gotten done, the buck's going to stop with me. In other words, yeah. even if it, nobody else does it, I still have the responsibility to make sure it gets done, which means if I have to pick it up and do it. And I think that jump where Paul was like, the gospel hasn't got to the Gentiles yet. Yes. And even if I'm the only one, I'm going to do it. I'm gonna and do it. Yeah. I'm going to do it. And that responsibility jump to say, no, I, I am responsible for it. I think is one of the biggest barriers to 
this Gen Z, this next up and coming generation really taking off in leadership in the kingdom of God is just that idea that the buck stops with me. And if nobody else does it, I will. Well, and so then you asked the question of how do you get there? And I'll bring in another story that we've kind of tossed around in recent weeks offline, Dave. And that's the story of David and Absalom, um, that, that in the development of David, um, as a leader, and then he becomes king, and then um, along comes Absalom, um, and there's this story that Absalom is is known for in Scripture, where he's standing at the gates, and as people are coming in to bring their concerns uh, to David as king, uh, he's he's calling him over, and he's talking with them, and he's wooing away the the hearts of the leaders of Israel, and you contrast that with David, who. Um, he started in the in literally in the mud. He's the muddy boots guy. He started literally in the mud on the hillside tending sheep. And because he was faithful with that test, God gave him more. And then there's the giant and he's faithful with that and God gives him more. And so um, then he's arriving at the place of leading all of Israel as king and not being willing to touch the Lord's anointed Saul. He's given it by the Lord. Um but all the way back to the very beginning, his identity was not being the king, not having the public uh, recognition and persona of king. It was, I'm a worshiper of God. I love God. Um, that's who he was. So he would, he didn't even show up at the Samuel walking in the door and like, who am I called to anoint his king? He didn't even show up, um, but he was the one that God picked and he was the one after God's own heart. So we contrast these two guys of David and Absalom and Absalom is the guy he's, he's trying to rely on his own expertise and his own ability. That's a pretty slippery way to lead because as soon as somebody comes along who can show that they have the expertise and they've got the ability, you lose your spot and you're overthrown. Um, but David, he's like, man, uh, here comes along. This is tragic. This is happening. He's heartbroken that this is happening with Absalom, but it, it wasn't his in the first place. Um, God was the one who gave it to him. His identity is always going back to being the shepherd boy and in the mud, trying to be faithful with the task that's put in front of him. And so I think as we talk about this idea of what does it look like, first of all, to step into Muddy Boots leadership, that's not just a sudden, oh, wow, Paul and Corinth, how do we get to? No, it's how do I have Muddy Boots with what's in front of me. And so Paul, after the road to Damascus, he turns around and he's got this unknown phase of his own ministry where right. we have no reason to think that he wasn't just out doing the work and getting in the mud. And and because he was faithful with that, Barnabas then in in Acts, where is it? Acts uh, 11, 12, he's, he's going yeah, and getting him right. and, and uh, brings him to Antioch. Well, that was because he was faithful with what was put in front of him. So the idea of muddy boots, it's it's the idea of raising up leaders to be faithful with the piece in front of them and then recognizing that and giving them more. Same thing with Timothy. Paul sees Timothy's. He's faithful, well-spoken of. Hey, I'm going to bring him along on the next journey. Right. So we got David in the field. Nobody's watching, only the Lord, and he's faithfully tending sheep. That's right. And the Lord goes and says, I'm going to anoint him. You have... Saul, who I think was in Cilicia in his home area of Tarsus, planting yep. churches and right. sharing with the Gentiles. And whenever they need somebody to help lead out and train up from Jerusalem and a, a basically Gentile church that none of the apostles officially started in Antioch, Barnabas is like, I know the guy. I'm going to go get guy. Paul. Right. Right. Um, when you see Paul in Corinth, you see Priscilla and Aquila just putting their head down and getting to work with him. And then right. he goes to Ephesus and drops them off and knows that he can trust them. He finds Timothy. That's right. And the church speaks highly of him when no one else is looking. Um, I think that there is a strong barrier. And you and I are always talking from a Western perspective, but I think there's a really strong barrier that um, this virtue signaling and fame is very, very important. Oh, yeah. I want to be seen as someone who knows what they're doing. But it doesn't matter to me whether or not I actually know what I'm doing. I just need to be seen that way. Yeah. And that 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 barrier right there is the one because at the end of the day, the Lord knows our hearts. Right. He's not looking at the outside. He's not looking right. to see Saul, who's a head and shoulders above everybody else. The degrees or the titles or the experience or the resume or all those things, those don't matter. The Instagram posts don't matter. The TikToks don't matter. 
the right. Lord's looking at us and he's saying, what are you doing in the mundane? I sorry, I went back there again, but the mundane everyday faithfulness, what are you doing with right. the job that you have when no one else is looking? What are you doing with the evangelism uh, and prayer walking and gospeling in an apartment complex when no one knows you're out there? Um, those things I think are the places where the Lord is going to say, okay, now I spot because the, the Bible teaches us that the Lord is looking to and fro over all the earth yes. to find a righteous man. And I think the way in which we behave in those small little moments has a whole lot to do with how the Lord is going to use us in the future and whether or not he makes the connections with people who are going to provide us the avenue for greater responsibility. But this is a difference, Mark. Yeah. When David went from being a shepherd keeper to king, it wasn't that glorious to him. Yeah. He knew he was king for a long time while he was on the run. But right. Absalom, I think you're right. Absalom grew up with a silver spoon in his mouth his whole life. Right. He did. Yeah. And so he wanted to jump straight from son of the king to king. Yeah. So, and so he went out and virtue signaled at the city gates and told everybody how he could do better than his daddy. So here's the difference. And this is this is what I've often said in terms of the kinds of leaders I will. Well, no, not the kinds of leaders I will trust, but like the way in which I will trust them, because I think I look at uh, Moses. He gets he tries to make his own calling happen. He's tossed into the wilderness. Right. And then uh, the burning bush happens. He goes in um, and he raises up Joshua who goes through the wilderness and he passes off the work to Joshua who goes in and he accomplishes the next phase of the work in, in the promised land. And then we've got David and David, he similarly, he is, he has a, a phase of ministry and leadership development, but then he ends up in the wilderness with all these guys um, that are the uh, all the discontents and they're all coming to David and they're <laughs> yeah. hanging out in the wilderness. Um, I'm not sure if I'd want to lead those guys, but this is the task that David has. And he's working with these guys. And like you said, by the time he gets to the, the role of king, he's been formed in this place of uh, the task and the the like shiny uh, spotlight of the role is not the point. It's about yeah, he's, he's doing it before the Lord and he's leading before the Lord. But then who does David pass it off to? Solomon. Solomon wasn't formed in the wilderness. And so we talk about Absalom, but then we've got his son, Solomon, who, who he passes it off to. And Solomon is the one who leads Israel astray, right? And so when I think of the common denominator between Moses, Joshua, David, uh, there's a successful baton pass to Joshua, wilderness. David, Solomon, right. no wilderness, no successful baton pass. And so if I think about, that's a lot of lot of thoughts there, but if I have to boil down the, the idea there, it's that God wants to form his leaders in the place of the unseen. And if we skip over that leadership development phase, um, we are going to either wreck the thing that got, he, or he won't entrust us to it, or or we'll wreck the thing uh, that, that he tries to put in our hands. Um, or he'll lead us into a place where we are forced into a wilderness experience where it's or uh we have to work out is God enough is my identity with him enough um or is it identity with Christ plus this other thing that is my identity so i think that's what when i think of all of what i see on instagram and and young leaders they are trying to work out their identity through this thing uh rather right. than that settled and they will until they embrace a wilderness season and allow it, allow God to form them um, where he is enough. Well, and I even go back to, you know, Christ himself is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he leaves heaven and he's born of a teenage girl who has to wipe his butt. Right. Like, okay, that is humility. Welcome to the H3X podcast. Here we are. Welcome to the H3X <laughs> podcast. Um, that's humility. But even whenever he's uh, emerging as an adult leader and the spirit right. says, now it's time, this is my son. And, and, and the father speaks as a, as a spirit descends on him. Yeah. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. This glorious moment of this is the Messiah. Yeah. And then he says, okay, now go out into the wilderness. And even Jesus has to have that fundamental wilderness experience and I think, Mark, one of the ways that I would use the muddy boots analogy is I would say leadership is not someone who gets picked 
and then they grab the boots, put them on, and then they go get muddy. Right. My analogy of the muddy boots is the reason a leader wears the muddy boots is because they have emerged out of the work and they were already wearing those boots and they were already muddy anyway. And people began to recognize through their labor, through their effort, through their responsibility, through their taking of consequences, through their humility, through their forgiveness, through their repentance, um, through their mistakes, through their successes, all of those things where they're out there getting those boots scratched up, getting them muddy, that, and they still are walking and they're still working and trying, that other people start to go, hey, how can I help you? Or they start to ask, what can I do to, to do what you're doing? Right. And they emerge out of the work, David. They emerge right. from the they emerge from the field, not someone who's like an Absalom who is wearing his royal silks and he comes down and says, Hey, can I borrow a pair of boots to work with you guys? It doesn't work that way. Right. It doesn't so, work that way. There's a, a a little book I read years ago. I'm not sure if you've read it, Dave. The the Three Kings book. Um, I can't remember who it's I sir, I heard you mentioned it, but I haven't ever read it. I might have to get around to it. Yeah, I, I can't I don't even know if I would recommend it. It's been too long since I've read it. But but the the, co the concept of it has stuck with me and basically this analysis of Saul, David, and Solomon and how they're formed as leaders and then the outcomes of those formations. And so Saul would be the other leader that we we should mention here, who was um exactly the opposite of what you're talking about. He was uh, recognized as the guy because of how he appeared. And then he tries to get his boots muddy by going and doing it. Um, but because he hadn't done the work and settled the issue of my identities and not attached to this thing that I do, he was right. always trying to perform and prove himself. And so he then has this issue of the sacrifice and uh, Samuel's late and it, it just becomes this, his downfall um, because he is still trying to work out um, where is, is he really King? Does he really have what it takes? And can he really trust God to show up? And he, he's working that out on in the stage in front of everybody. He's not working that out at the level of with the sheep. Do I have what it takes? And God, are you really going to show up? Da, da, da. I mean, that's a, there's a, that's just an issue we've got to work out and we've got to uh, we've got to pass that test. And um, cool. there's another book. Um, all these things are coming up for me right now as we're talking, but uh, I, oh, I know what it is. John Eldridge is fathered by God. So um, if you guys who are listening to this, if you've never uh, checked out this book, he, he basically identifies within the life of David, these different stages of his development as a leader and from uh, uh, beloved son to the shepherd a uh, kid to the warrior to the king and then finally he's a sage at the end of his life but the point that he kind of makes in the book is if you don't if you don't pass that test if david hadn't passed that test at whatever stage it was he's going to be working that out as a king he's going to be working out what what he should have worked out as the shepherd kid and i think that's true for all of us so you see in the life of yeah. Saul he's he's on the world stage now or the uh, the the stage of the nation as the king, but he's still trying to work out. Can I really trust God? Do I, what is my real identity? Um, because he's never had that piece worked out. So the reason why David is um, the one that God loves, the the man after God's own heart um, is not, I mean, it is, maybe it's a unique David thing. I think it's more just like he chose to enter into that kind of relationship with God at this level of shepherd boy so that whatever God put him into after that, he wasn't trying to figure that out um, in that within the. Well, and even if we go, yeah, and even we go back and we start reading the descriptions of the northern kings after the split up. One of the ways in which they're described is is that they did evil uh, in the sight of the Lord, and they were unlike their father, uh, unlike the the father David. Um, they did not turn from their wrong, and so the the thing that that really marked David was it's not that he was a perfect man, it's not that he had everything right. He, yeah. Plenty of mistakes. Right. Plenty. I yeah. mean, when the guy's dying and an old man, there's a reason that you'll get a beautiful young version to lay in the bed to keep him warm. And then they have to take the point. They have to take the little point of the Bible to say, and he was not intimate with this woman. OK, clearly, David had women issues because they came out with his uh, son. Yeah. OK, <laughs> right. He's not a perfect man in any regard. Not As a matter all. of fact, most of the things that he did would have, you know, you and I wouldn't even be even allowed to even be 
close to leadership at that point. Right. But when he was confronted with his sin, he returned and repented to the Lord. That was the mark of David because I think he had a fear of the Lord. He did. That was it was very strong. That was wrought, as you said, in that wilderness of shepherding, right? Where That's he's a good like, way to put it. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna go fight this Goliath. Well, the Lord rescued me from a lion. Can't he rescue me from this uncircumcised, you know, uh blasphemer? Give me yeah. some rocks. I got right, it. Right. Um, right. where did that come from? That came from his trust in the Lord. It all of this kind of reminds me of that parable that Jesus taught about the talents, right? Where he gives one two, he gives one five, and he gives another worker. 10 and he goes away and whenever he comes back he says now give me back my money with interest and the one that had five had gained five more and he's like here you go the one that got 10 here's 10 more and then his response is you've been faithful in a few things now i'll give you five cities you've been faithful in a few things now i'm going to give you leadership over 10 cities and then he gets to the one with the with the, the two talents and he says or the single talent and he says you know, where's my money? And he's like, well, here, I'm going to give you back exactly what you gave me. Well, why didn't you give me more? Why didn't you do something with it? Well, I was fearful of you because I know you're a harsh man. And so I went and buried it. And I think Mark, that, that fear of being a failure, because that guy with the two talents, he's like, I'm afraid of losing them. And so I'm just going to go bury them so that at least when he comes back, I'll have be able to get back what he had. And he's like, the point is I gave you those talents not to go bury them, but to do something with them. Right. We don't have, we don't have a hypothetical other story where let's say he showed up and he said, I tried with the two. I'm sorry. I lost them all. I'd be really curious to what the Lord's response would be to that. Um, but I think the answer to that is when you go and you're faithful with what God has given you responsibility for That's big it. or small, the Lord will multiply those efforts. And the point is, is that the five talents weren't multiplied by their effort. They were multiplied by the effort plus. Um, and I think we're so afraid of losing that we never, ever get the opportunity to go risk right. for fruitfulness. Right. And that that risk is something that David was willing to take. That risk was something that Paul was willing to take. That risk was something that Jesus was willing to take that risk is something that Timothy was willing to take. My gosh, he got circumcised as an adult. Yeah. Um, like he was, he was on board. And how do we, I think I'm going to ask one last question of you, Mark, and if you got some more thoughts, but how do we, as those who are in the season of life where now we're mentoring who we used to be, the ones who wanted leadership before we were ready, right? When we were in our twenties or teens. Yeah. Now we're mentoring and we're watching as these guys go through and these girls go through this process, what are some things that you've learned that you would pass along to say, here's some important pieces to do to make sure that we don't usurp that season and that we allow them to go through that. And what is it like mentoring someone as they're going through that season? What do you think? You're asking me this question. I should be asking you this. Uh, I I, I'll share a couple thoughts and then you got to jump in. But um, I think, well, I don't know how this fits into your question, but one thought I had, and and this is, um, I just want to throw this out there as like a testimony, practical, that um, I got rid of social media a couple years ago in terms of personal. And I think what it has done for my own heart is I've realized that um, if I post about something that I'm going to do before I do it, it short circuits that uh, the risk reward idea that you're talking about. So when you talk about, um, the, the talents piece, um, I think there's a dynamic to which I will just say from my own experience that when I am communicating this risk that I'm going to take to do this thing, um, if my reward is a bunch of likes on a, on a post on Facebook, on YouTube, on Instagram, on TikTok, whatever it is, um, then that has just given me the reward rather than investing in the risk, uh, of trying to do something with what God's spoken and what God's given me, um, that will pay out. And so I think there's this dynamic, I guess, to, to bring that back of like, we've got to, we've got to actually fail and, uh, learn from our failures that, 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 that kind of translates to for me. And so that, I guess is maybe even advice for those that are uh, addicted to or really focused on the social media dynamic of all of that. Um, but as far as what we've got to do in mentoring and raising up leaders, 
um, we've got to help to create a, an environment where failure is okay and even expected and where um, failure is seen as, as a, a step in growth. And then um, maybe alongside of that, where there are um, clear goals that are created by, um, by the leaders we're working with and then accountability to those goals and learning from those goals. So all of those things kind of stirred together where there's a removal of a reward without actually taking a risk, plus an environment where there are goals being set that you're actually being accountable for, and there's a value for actually taking risk and failing and learning from those failures. I think those are some basic keys for helping leaders rise up. Two, two illustrations that bring to mind, Mark, I think those are excellent. Excellent. I'm sitting here thinking through it. I'm like, oh, I'm going to listen to this podcast again to hear you say that all over again so I can think <laughs> through it again. That is that a little self-serving? I don't know. Um, but I'm going to do it because I'm going to learn from what you just said again and process it some more. But two things that come to mind is, one, um, when we're training in a group event dynamic, you can tell the people who train who have muddy boots and the people who are trained who just have content and information. There's a difference in the way in which they talk, talk about things. There's a humility that comes with someone with muddy boots and there's a simplicity that comes from somebody with muddy boots. Uh, and there is an openness to it not being perfect in everybody's understanding when the training is over with somebody who has muddy boots. I tend to find somebody who just has the content. It's all about precision on what's on the board. The, the, the illustrations, whenever a question is asked, the way in which they illustrate will usually be somebody else's story or an old stale story that they have from the first time that they tried it. Yeah. And the third thing that I'll notice a lot is um, they don't leave a lot of room for discussion because they don't have much to discuss when the practical questions come up because they're still attached to the whiteboard. Yeah. And so, you know, when someone has gone out and prayer walked and tried to share the gospel and using the phrase that you and I talk about all the time, the harvest is the great equalizer. It doesn't yeah. matter if you're the greatest trainer or missionary that's ever lived. When you go out into the harvest, it treats the newbie and the mature alike. And it is, yeah. it is, it is the great equalizer. Right. The second thing is a, a actual practical uh, illustration. So I've got a new guy that's working uh, with us at Tide. He's a great young man, made some great decisions to get life going in the right direction. He's had a pretty rough past. And um, we'll just leave it at the fact that he is wanting to make a significant shift in his life. And the Lord brought him supernaturally, actually, into our business. And um, it's just a joy to watch him kind of doing what you're saying. He's making a lot of failures right now, but um, he's learning. And I'll show one illustration uh, in our business you have to make sure that clothes get clean. And so if you leave a pin in the pocket of one of the clothes and that pin breaks open while it's being washed, a whole lot of bad stuff begins to happen. And so we teach everybody buttons, pocket stains, damage, right? Those are the things you check, but pocket stains, damage. And so he didn't check one of the pockets. He left a pin in one and, or it might've been a vitamin, but uh, it left orange all over an entire load of garments. And so when all was said and done, the pi the payouts um, that I had to buy garments that had been ruined, I'm a little over $1,500 now that it cost uh, to pay for, for the garments that got ruined because of a simple mistake of something, a pocket wasn't checked and something wasn't pulled out of it. And uh, it was a very simple mistake on his behalf, his part. In the grand scheme of things, the consequences don't match the crime, right? That that what happened because of his simple mistake of not setting a checking a pocket far outweighed what you would think could potentially happen. But nonetheless, it's a big deal. And um, I had a conversation with him where I said, listen, this is how important checking pockets are. And he said, I'm so sorry, I won't do it again. I said, well, let me put a stamp on it. This has cost me about $1,500 up to this point. And it, I, he, his face went, you know, when people get super nervous and they get the red splotches all over their face because they're extremely nervous. Yeah. He turned red splotchy. And um, I just said to him, I said, here's the deal. This will show you how important it is to make sure you check pockets. But I also want to make sure that that my $1,500 has been a good investment in your training. 
In other words, if I'm going to pay $1,500, it doesn't bother me as long as that $1,500 buys both of us a really good lesson, which means you won't do it again. And you'll make sure that if you ever have an opportunity to train others, you'll express to oh. them the importance of yeah. not doing this again, yeah. that you will not only learn the lesson, but you'll teach the lesson. That's worth the investment to me because then it'll save me who knows how many more payouts in the future. If you plus the people that are around, you learn not to do that. All that's to simply say, Mark, I think when we're doing what you just shared, as we're trying to train and teach and mentor people who are going through this wilderness stage, it just seems to be very intense in your 20s. You do it over and over and over in life. It's just really hard in your 20s because you want everything now and you're tired of waiting and you think you've grown up. And so it's your time and you wonder why everybody's holding you back. And you don't realize that there's older gentlemen in your life that are saying you need to slow down and allow this to take place. And you're like, in your 20s, you're like, what are you talking about? I got everything I need. All I would say is to go back and say, I never realized how much it was going to, how it, how much it costs the mentors in my life to allow me to have those mistakes. And I think, Mark, yeah. if we take your advice, which I think we should, I wholeheartedly agree with that. So much so, like I said, I'm going to listen to it again and learn some more out of it. We got to realize that if we're going to do this, it's going to cost us a lot to allow the guys around us that are emerging to make mistakes because those mistakes will cost us yes. more than it will cost them. Yeah. And even after I vented to you this morning, it's a good reminder as you say that to even go that those costs are worth it, even if the results don't turn out the way that you want, because it's the only way to get there. We're never going to see these young men and women step up and take this responsibility and take it seriously, even in the face of consequences like Paul and Timothy and David and all those things, if we don't provide them an environment to say it really is okay to make mistakes as long as you learn from them and then know that the brunt of that is going to be taken by you, yeah. the mentor. Um, and so it even makes me honestly go, do I, am I really strong in my calling to say, reminding myself that the consequences of trying to raise up this next generation are worth it for me. Right. 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 Because there's no other way for us to get there. We're in, in order for the church to multiply the way that it needs to, we have got to have Gen Z and then and the next one after Alpha Gen. They're yeah. gonna have to step up to the plate and learn these lessons. And it's our job now as men in our forties to start taking on that role of yeah. we're somewhere between King Sage, <laughs> right? Where we're still muddy yeah. boots leaders, but we're having to play the sage while our boots are muddy. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And you know, the other uh, theme that we'll often talk about on this podcast is that the kingdom really is about people at the end of the day. And so at uh, the end of the day, that's it. I think just keeping our eyes on that, that um, the, what Jesus is looking for is a bride that's ready and the task, the the disciples making disciples, it's, it's, it's gotta be about not about numbers and about, church names and this and that and whatever, but it really is about the development of people. And so, um, so yeah, getting there, it's going to require mess and helping those leaders, uh, step through that mess. But, uh, but somebody has got to take a risk on somebody and let them work it out. So Paul did that with Timothy. Paul did that with Priscilla and Achilla and a whole list of other people. Barnabas did that with Paul and took a risk on him, um, that he modeled to him something that he then uh, turns around and does for others. So um, if we're going to get there, we've got to, uh, we've got to model that. We got to invite them into that um, and take a risk on them, um, but then create space for them to, to fail and to grow, to learn from it. And um, yeah, really lay down our life. That's what this muddy boots piece looks like. You've been a great counselor to me today, Mark. Thank you. <laughs> we talked through some stuff. Hopefully this is helpful for uh, other people listening and watching. We'll see y'all next time. Thanks for listening, for watching. If this content has been helpful for you, please take a minute to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. It really helps us to get this content out there farther to serve Jesus, grow his kingdom, and accomplish the Great Commission until there is no place left. Much love to you guys. See you next time. Thank you.